continue in the study Galatians chapter 1, I would then naturally say next, I need you to turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy 4. Okay. So we will now go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. As we continue to study Galatians chapter 1. What's been going on in Galatians? Paul has been saying this. I am so surprised that so quickly you are turning your back. Hear me, not just on church, but on Jesus himself. Did you know every time we turn our back on church, or turn our back on Christian music, or turn our back on our Christian friends, we are really turning our back on who? Jesus himself. Jesus himself. So I'm, I'm surprised how quickly you are turning your back and then going to another gospel, which is really not a gospel. Uh, so anytime we turn from the real to the fantasy, we haven't turned to real, we turn to what? Fantasy. Have you ever met someone who just says, oh, I know I'm married, but this other person just makes me feel so much better, and they treat me so much better, and things are so much better? You know why? Because they're not married to you. <laughs> and, and we live in a fantasy world. We just think if we could ever get to that other blade of grass on the other side of the, that we would probably ruin that blade of grass too. And so we started next week. Now, last week, we're going to continue for a couple more weeks. I'm going to put a slogan up there, and don't just yell out your answer. But write it down. Write down yes, if you think the answer is yes. Write down no, if you think the answer is no. Now, how many of us remember this from last week? I'm going to ask you phrases that are maybe in the Bible, maybe not in the Bible. But write your answer down. Write your answer down. Because this way, when you write down the right answer, and they go, see, and they show it to you. But if they don't show you, chances are they wrote the wrong answer. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first one. Pride goes before a fall. Don't yell it. Don't yell it. Write it on your paper. Yes, that's in the Bible. No, that's not in the Bible. And, and several people at the early service had a perfect paper. But not at the end of today. Just giving you a fair warning. Okay, pride goes before a fall. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of us think it comes from Proverbs 16, 18? But it doesn't. This is not in the Bible. No. Whoa, wait a second. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It says pride goes before destruction. Now, let me tell you. You see, what Satan wants us to think is pride just goes before a little fall, a little slip, a little hiccup, not that big a deal. God says, if you fall, it's destruction. I don't like to see you get hurt. He doesn't take a look at our momentary lapses of judgment and just get, ha, aren't they funny? That's just the way I created them to act like that. No, he created us to be what? Pure and wholesome and godly. And every time pride seeps in, it's not just a little fall, it's total destruction. This word here for destruction in Hebrew is sabir. And it means this. It means not just the fall, but the destruction of the spirit. You know what happens? Pride comes in and our ability to pray goes out. Anybody think that's a small one? What does Psalm 66, 18 say? If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear nor answer my prayers. Anybody think that's something simple? That we should play with? If you play with sin, you're going to get burned. Pride goes before destruction, and destruction starts off in my spirit. So the answer to the first one, is it in the Bible? The answer is no. Now you would say, aren't you just doing semantics? Anybody remember a person by the name of Satan? 58 times that word shows up in Scripture. All 58, never capitalized. Because God does not give him any credence. He's the accuser of the elect. We don't capitalize. And how would he tempt Jesus? Isn't it written? Isn't it written? Isn't it written? He tempted him with misquoted scripture. Pride, isn't it written? Pride goes before a little fall of Jesus. And Jesus would say, that's not in the Bible. A little fall is not what I said. I said destruction. You mean so, you know, when your baby falls, do you go, oh, get up, you big baby. Some of those do. But if they were to fall and chip a tooth, like Janice did, how many of us would say, oh, no, you're going to have to get them? In other words, they say that destructed her, her teeth at this moment. 
Can they be fixed? God can fix anything. How important is it then to call sin, sin, and not say, well, it's kind of like a verse in the Bible. To misquote a verse and take it out of context and take it out of exactly what God said is to add to or subtract from. And what does God say about that in the book of Revelation? Don't do it. If we're not supposed to do it, to do it is sin, right? Wow. That's why it's so nitpicky. Moderation in all things. Don't yell out your answer. Now, how many of us know that that's a, a favorite slogan for people who put people on diets? Well, you don't have to cut it all out, just moderation. So, so what if you're a type 15 diabetic? Just have a little bit of sugar. What will a little bit of sugar do to an extremely diabetic person? Now, this comes from a guy by the name of Aristotle and his doctrine of the mean. How many? Not in the Bible. We got that one okay? Not in the Bible. What did Aristotle say? He says, find out the mean, and that's where you know where the average is, right in the middle. We're all familiar with that. And so he would say that the mean between bravery on one end and cowardice on the other end, in the face of danger, his word would be courage. Courage. What is courage? It's the middle between what? Bravery and cowardice. But a lot of people think Aristotle said moderation, and they highlight this word, all. Now, how many of us, you know, getting away from the fact that it's not in the Bible, how many of us are going, yeah, that sounds about right, right? Moderation in all things, right? We're buying that in America today. Let me just tell you, that's absolutely a lie. He did not believe in all moderations in all things. We do not accept a moderate amount of evil, do we? How much, you know, uh, toxic waste do you want in your ice cream? Yeah. A moderate amount, right? <laughs> Just because it's not totally toxic waste, does that mean you want to eat around the edges? And yet we'll do that with sin. Well, I'm not really in sin. I'm just... What's, how many seconds in your family is it before, when it hits the floor before you can pick it back up and eat? <laughs> you know what the answer in my house is? None. If it hits the floor... It hit the floor. There have been times I didn't want it to hit the floor. And Margaret have said, I just washed that floor six or seven months ago. <laughs> <laughs> because we are so attached to what dropped instead of trying to be detached from the dirt. Anybody catching something here? Okay. But 1 Corinthians 9.25 says this. That if anyone is going to compete, first of all, lay aside all things so that you can compete to the highest level. Now, let's just say that Caleb was going to become a part of the Olympic uh, water polo team. And he is a water polo player, and it is it's possible. But in order for Caleb to become an Olympic water polo player, what would you have to do, Caleb? What do you think you'd have to do? Practice. How about your diet? Oh, yeah. Would you have to, how about staying away from performance enhancing drugs? <coughs> How about any of your friends who might want to go do something slightly illegal? And you go, well, you know, it's not like we're really robbing anybody. But what would happen if you were picked up with people who were? In other words, I might have to get rid of some friends. I might have to get rid of some diet. I might, I, in other words, I've got to focus on what my what? What my goal is. And that's exactly what he is saying. It's not moderation in all things, but have a goal. What should our goal be in this world? To look just like our Savior. To talk just like our Savior. To act just like our Savior. We are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. What does that mean? When John Kerry gets off the plane, who does he represent? Not President Obama. He represents each and every one of us. So every time we walk out into the world, who do you represent? Jesus Christ and every Christian ever. Wow. How about this one? The eyes are the windows to the soul. No yell at your answer. Is it in the Bible? Yes or no? Your eyes, the eyes. You're looking at each other. That's why some of us wear sharp dark glasses. Because we don't want anybody looking into my soul. The eyes are the windows to the soul. What do we think? 
The answer to that is Matthew 6, 22. Whoa, 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 wait a second. I'm putting scripture up there. So that means I'm trying to say that the answer might be what? Yes. It's not. Okay, let's show you how Satan can misuse this one. It says the eyes is the lamp to the soul, not the lamp of the soul. So in other words, if my eyes, if I open the eyes of my heart, I see things God's way rather than putting on the sunglasses and seeing things in an opaque way. What is an opaque way? It means delusion by humanity. You see, both passages say the eyes is the lamp. So if your eye is clear, if your lamp is bright, you'll see everything in the way in which God wants you to see it. We're not stumbling around in the dark. We see it. Did you know that one of the most dangerous places in the world is not the dark, but the light all the time? You go to the North Pole or you go to the South Pole, very few shadows. Everything is so right, white and bright and, and, and just, just, you can walk right up to the cliff and fall right off. In other words, we need to not be able to just say everything's white. We need to be able to say what? I can see what's true. I can see what's false, and I choose to what? Live in the light. Both say it is not from the outside looking at life. Wonder what's going on in your soul. Wonder what's going on in your soul. Wonder what's going on in your soul. The job of scripture and the job of scripture in us is not to look from the inside out or the outside in, but the discernment from the inside in. Inside, the light of God is so bright in my spirit that I see everything from God's point of view. And then I don't say, oh, you did that wrong. I say, oh, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. So instead of there being a way that I can tear you down, it becomes a way that God can what? Strengthen me up. So instead of dealing with the pieces of sawdust in your eye. I'm taking care of the tree trunks in my own. All right, here we go. To thine own self be true. To thine own self be true. It's got to be in the Bible because it sounds like the King James Version. How many of us know it comes from Hamlet? Hamlet, and that is found in 2 Nehemiah. What? No. I'm, I'm, okay. Hamlet. Anybody here of these names? Polonius, Claudius. And Polonius is Claudius' main advisor. But he's looking at Claudius' son, Laertes, who's on his way from Denmark back to France because something was rotten in the state of Denmark. Now, here's what the problem is. Too many of us think that our job is to sniff out your rotten. But how many of us get so used to being in the rotten we don't even smell it anymore. I love those Febreze commercials. Where they put somebody in a, anybody know what I'm talking about? They put them in a car, they fill the car up with all kinds of stuff. They spray a little bit of it. First of all, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I believe if you put me in a car filled with that stuff, I wouldn't go, oh, it smells like the great outdoors. <laughs> I think I'd be able to figure it out. But how many of us, Satan will give you a quick spritz. And in the midst of that quick spritz, he will desensitize us to the garbage that's all around. He says this, above all things, to thine own self be true. Now, now wait a second. Now, if I'm going to be true to myself, the first opinion that I've got to think is the right opinion is... My opinion. Isn't that the thesis behind this? To thine own self be true. In other words, I don't care what you think, and I don't care what you think, and I don't care what you think, because the only thing that makes any thump is what I think. I conjugate. Now think about this. We're broken and jaded by sin. Is that correct? Which one of us could say that what we think is exactly what God thinks all the time? Any of us? It says that even our righteousness, this is the Bible, even our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. And if you want to be absolutely grossed out, go look up what that really means. That's filthy stuff. 
Our righteousness. Now, what is our righteousness? The best of the best of the best that we can do. Our best of our best of our best in this world is what still? Filthy man. Now, why would I want to go to myself, who is broken and jaded by sin, and to my own self be too? When I know that all my righteousness is as filthy rags. In other words, if I turn to me, I can guarantee I just turn to the wrong person. Now, I've told you this story before, but I want to tell it again. I was working as a tool and die maker. So I was working in the back, and I was working, and this guy, I would read my Bible every morning before work and at lunch, and this guy come back here, and he says, hey, I, I need your opinion on something going on in my house. And he asked me the question, and this is what I said. Well, God's Word says, and he says, whoa, stop, time out. I don't want to know what God's Word says. I want to know your opinion. Your opinion. And my answer was, my opinion is, I believe God's Word. Now, obviously, that was not his opinion. In other words, I don't want to know what God thinks, because if God thinks it, I'm probably responsible to think it too. So don't give me God. Give me some watered-down version of God. Yeah. Give me Bible, you know, two. Bible light. Give me Christianity for dummies. Okay. We would choose poorly if we choose ourselves. <coughs> I'm not saying that we're not smart. I'm not saying God doesn't intend to even use your brain. But he never gave us the ability to think so we could think him out of existence. All right, last one. And the lion will lie down with the lamb. In the Bible? In the Bible? Go ahead and yell it out. No. Who, you saying no? You're going to tell me you can't find that in Isaiah in two it's different places? It's worded differently. You know, it never says that. It says this, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the wolf will die. You would say, wait, time out, Ray, semantics again. Oh, no. You realize that we substituted, because it goes on to say, that the lion itself will lie down with the cattle. Yeah. The cattle. With the beasts of the burden of the field. And so, uh, but that didn't make a strong enough picture. Uh, it just doesn't make a good enough statue. I want a little lamb and a roaring lion to get along together. Not just a wolf and a lamb. So I'll go ahead. If I add to or I subtract from or I change God's word, what does God call that? Yeah. Evil. 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 So we did it for the sense of the drama. Let me just tell you, you don't need drama. Anybody need drama in your life? No. I'm trying to live in a drama-free environment. Margaret says she is too, but I keep coming home. <laughs> Drama. I don't need drama. How do I create drama? I create it. Let me say that again. Drama can find us, right? In this world, there are going to be some what? Accidents and troubles. It is not the presence of trouble. It is the presence of God. Because when I see him, I find strength to do what? Face the day. And in his presence, all my fears are what? Why do we sing that over and over and over again? Because how many of us forget what it happens? Just forget it. All right. This is what we have been studying. That the gospel is twofold. To the person who has never been saved, the first phase of the gospel is the salvation message. The death, burial, and the resurrection. But after that, how many people get saved and then they never learn another thing about the Bible? They never learn another thing about God. Not while we're here at this church. If you come to this church, we want to bring out the whole counsel of God. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6. And what does it say? If you put these things before the brothers and sisters in Christ, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Because you're going to start training them. My job is not to just say, see, look at all these little things. My job is to prepare you so that when you leave here and trouble comes into your life, you are not blown out of the water by it. We can wait on the Lord without anxiety attacks. We can walk with the Lord and renew our strength. We can learn how to walk and run, but it's got to start with a real desire to grow deeper. So more than just get saved, more than just get baptized, we need to grow up in Christ. We started a couple of weeks ago talking about desire. 
Desire means what? The sincere truth of the word. But in order for me to understand the word, there are some things in the Bible I'm not going to understand unless I've studied this, to study this, to study this. Sometimes experience this, to experience this, to experience that. Have you ever done something, and the first time you, oh, that, that is, oh, But the more God gives you the opportunity to exercise those muscles, you don't just get used to it, you get what? Capable of handling it. Now means what? I name where I really am in my faith. If you're a spiritual baby, but you got saved 30 years ago, don't say, I'm a spiritual giant, I've been saved for 30 years. It's not how many years ago you got saved, but how much growing up in Christ you've done every day since. There's a story about a young man that wanted to become a fireman. And so uh, we'd go and watch the firemen and we'd watch it on television. And one of these days I'm going to do that. Went to college and got a degree in fire science. He was so good at it that they offered him a master's degree. He was so excelled in that that they said, go into the PhD program. Got his PhD and taught fire science for 30 years and died having never fought a fire in his entire life. You see, there are so many people that get saved as a child and they never get in in the real world. It's all academic. What is God saying? Grow. I want you to study to show yourself that you can present yourself. So the purpose of the study is for presentation. In other words, somebody's got to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And who does he intend that to be? All of us. But before we can go preach the gospel, we better first of all ask ourselves, who am I really in Christ? What do I really know? Name where I am own where I am, and win the goal of being called into further service. Last week we talked about nourishment. And I asked this question, would you rather have synthetic food or real food? And how many of us said, just give me those instant taters? Yeah. <laughs> give me that faux turkey bacon. First of all, what is faux turkey? You know what it is? Cardboard. <laughs> With a little bit of side. Well, if you put enough chalula, it'll taste all right. But I will go away. It might taste all right, but it's any good for you. In other words, if we substitute Bible substitute, there will be no real growth. So what did we say last week? Real spiritual food will produce real spiritual growth. And what did he say last week in Hebrews? I'm surprised by now you should be being the teacher in Sunday school, being the preacher at some pre preaching point. You should be used as leading, and you're still in your spiritual diapers. So we talked about desire has to be for real food. Real food. Today we want to talk about exercise. How many of us love to exercise? I love to exercise. In fact, uh, uh, most days, if anybody knows where I live, most days between the hours of 2 and 4, you'll see me outside either running, uh, we're working out. I've got, I've got an elliptical bike on wheels. Very, very hard to do. George has seen me uh, wimp. They called me a wimp yesterday, I think. I yes, I think you called me a wimp. Because uh, I was putting it in the back of the truck. Uh, we were down here by, uh, down by uh, Home Depot. And I was loaded up in the back of the truck. And he goes, real men would ride at home. Or something like that. So, uh, I love working out. I love to work out. I love working out in the heat of the day. I love it. The hotter it is, the sunnier it is, the hundred plus it is, you'll find me out there. And Margaret says, I, I don't know that man. I love to exercise, but hear me. Exercise for the sake of this body is of a little good. Exercise for the sake of this body can be eternal. And which gains are we really looking to promote? Am I just trying to exercise this? Or are we as a group desiring to exercise? Notice what it says. It says, now the Spirit expressly says, 1 Timothy 4, 1. How many of your Bible says expressly? Some versions of the Bible says clearly. Anybody see that in 1 Timothy 4? Clearly? We got it clearly? Anybody? Else? Did you know it can be absolutely clear to you, but absolutely not clear to somebody else? Can we do this? Which one's better? One or two? Two or one? 
One or two. Two or one. Anybody ever had that kind of thing happen to you? And then they put great big drops in your eyes and say, all right, go out and drive the track. Now, how many of us know that uh, what's clear to somebody may not be clear to somebody else? Have you ever had somebody try to give you the definition of how to do something, and you go, uh-huh, 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 and then you go to do it, and you go, uh-huh. <laughs> okay, and so it says expressly clear. In order for me to clearly know what God wants me to do, I've got to be in clear focus with who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Is that right? In other words, I don't run ahead and say, come on, Holy Spirit. I've got to be what? I've got to be patient. I've got to fall in line. I've got to clearly see. In other words, if you don't know if your yes should be yes or your no should be no, your answer is what? I don't know yet. Not now. Not yet. Still praying. Don't say you're praying if you're not praying. Don't try to sound spiritual. Well, are you going to do it? <coughs> Praying for you to go away and quit asking. <coughs> I might be praying, but I may not be praying. Okay, expressly clear. I've got to be in tune and in touch with the Holy Spirit. And in these latter times, let me put that back up with you. Notice what it says. When, according to God, did the parousia start to begin? 3380. We we are waiting for the end times, but we are currently in the end times. We are in the precursor to the end times. Now, what are people going to be like in the precursor to the end times? They're going to depart from faith. We don't have to wait for the for the full culmination of the Antichrist. There are already many Antichrists already pulling us in that direction. And, and we have gotten so used to the little tugs that we don't notice. Now, I guarantee you, if somebody just walks up to you, let me borrow your hand for a second, just walks up to you, give you a yank, you're going to notice. But if they do this, just slightly, ever so slightly, you would just get what? Used to it. What do we used to say? We'd take a frog, put it in a pan of cold water, put the pan of cold water on top of the oven, turn the oven on, and slowly pinch your grandmother, and so uh, and slowly bring the, what will happen to the frog? It will just sit there. It will just sit there. It doesn't even notice. You would say, never happened to a human. We know, right? How many times did Samson get tied up by Delilah? Let me just say, guys, let me touch you. You go over to your girlfriend's house, you relax, you fall asleep, you wake up all tied up. <laughs> and you go, that's no big deal, I'm going back tomorrow, right? <laughs> you know, we're just dumb enough, we say, yeah, I don't want to go back tomorrow. A lady would say, she woke up tied up, she don't go back. Uh, Sam's a kept going back, ain't going back, is that right? Samson kept going back and going. Is that right? Yeah. Samson kept going back and going back. And every time she cried out, the Philistines are upon you! And he would say that he would snap like they were little pieces of thread until God gave to his forgiveness. Now, a lot of people think his strength came from his hair. As someone who can completely say that I'm so strong, I, I don't need hair in order to be strong. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, pride comes before what? Destruction. I'm going to be careful. Okay. And so his strength really didn't come from his hair, even though he took a Nazarite vow. It says he didn't realize that his head had been shaved. No, that's how it reads. It says he didn't realize that the Holy Spirit had what? Departed. 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 In other words, desensitized, desensitized, desensitized. And what happens? It says they depart from the faith. Now that doesn't mean that they were saved and then they get unsaved. I believe that once someone in our world with the Holy Spirit and the death, burial, and resurrection, once you are saved, you are saved. But there are some people that have a working knowledge of salvation who are not saved. They're just hanging out with the sheep. Everybody got that? Just because somebody can, can say, I know Jesus died on the cross does not mean they believe and trust their sin to be paid on that cross. 
Because the Bible says this, Satan knows that. All of the demons know that. But how many of them believe that? That's another one. And so they depart. They departed from being in the presence of the eternal God to being cast out of glory. And if it was true for the demons, what do you think the demons want to do with you? Exact same thing. He, so we depart from the faith. And then it says what? And then we become devoted to what? Deceitful demons. They will lie to you. They will tell you anything you want to hear. They will tell you, oh, that other guy will treat you so much better. Oh, that other girl will treat you so much better. Oh, that other job would be so much better. Oh, you know, you don't have time for church. This would be so much better. They will tell you all the deceitful lies. And guess what it says? Once we pull away from real faith, that's what RF stands for, we become really open to all of the deceitful lies. But not only that, it goes on to say this, it will brand our conscience. Take a look here. It says at the end of verse number two, whose consciences are seared. The demon's conscience are seared, and if we listen to them, ours will get seared. You know what this word is in the Hebrew? It means to be branded. Now, I've been a cowboy. Has anybody like me, if you ever, anybody ever done any real branding? George, anybody else? I've, I've been cowboy work. And so why do you put the brand on the livestock? Why? You know it's his. And you know what? Satan wants to so brand you that when the world looks at you, they say, that person belongs to Satan. That person belongs to Satan. That person. Right? Why do I want to have all the brands of Satan on me? All the activity. If I'm really wanting to be godly, don't I want to have the appearance of godliness instead of the seared conscience and the branded body of Satan? Okay, it goes on to say this. Then they accept the balls, and then we expand it. So once I walk away from real faith, I accept the teachings of the demons, I intensify those lies into bigger lies about things like marriage and food and recreational drug use. Because we'll say this, it's not drugs, it's medicine. Remember, I'm not trying to do anything because what does verse 6 say? If you put these things before the brothers, it will be good. Starting next week, we're going to take a look at this claim. Everything created by God is good and nothing to be directed if it is received with grace. Isn't that exactly what he's going to say? And they're going to say, this has to do with taking marijuana. This has to do with drinking alcohol. This has to do with, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'm going to bring up some points like this. Just because God created it doesn't mean we didn't ruin it by the fall. And are we supposed to be the people that just say, to thine own self be true, or to God's word be true? We're going to take a look at this response. That just because God created something initially good, we can make it evil. Anybody know that in the Bible God created animals, but he didn't create them for you to have sex with? God created herbs, but does he, did he create it for you to ingest and smoke? If that was true, go get some hemlock. Go out there and start chewing on those oleanders. Oh, but no. oh, wait a second now. If you're going to say every herb, do every herb. Not just the one that... We're going to take a look. Let's be sober-minded. What does that mean? The word for sober is nepo. Anybody can think of a bigger Latin word for nepo? It means death. Put to death. In other words, I put to death what will prevent me from being an Olympic on the Olympic water polo team. Are all those things okay? Sure. He could eat cheeseburgers, six, seven of them a day, but he'll probably sink to the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and how many of us are doing spiritual cheeseburgers and wondering why our spiritual lives are sinking? It says, put it to death. We'll talk about that. In response to this one, do not be intoxicated. Intoxicated is not just with alcohol. It means the inability to say no and have self-discipline. Have you ever met somebody that would never have done that unless they were high? Never have done that unless they were slightly inebriated. Never would have done that unless God says, take the Melissa out. 
live in such a way that you never do that. Unless an accident happens. And then it's not on purpose, it's on accident. Steps to spiritual maturity. Desire. We have to have the real food. We've started part one. We'll take a look at part two on how to grow up in our spiritual exercise. And someday down the road, we're going to talk about patience. And you go, but I want to talk about patience today. <laughs> because we all want patience and we all want it now. Yeah. And so what does the Bible tell us? If you don't do it in this order, you're going to find yourself like a tree in the wind being blown back and forth. And we'll talk about you next in other words, how do we firm up the foundation of this thing called the life God's given me so that people could see me and instead of seeing me, see the glory of God being exacted through the way in which I live my life and love other people and experience all of the problems that happen that when my coffee falls, I take 20-something seconds of, oh, no. But my life is not dependent upon a cup of coffee. But how many of us are living like that's the last caffeine in the world. When the only stimulus I really need is the resurrected Jesus Christ. All right, let's read it together. Who's ready? Before we go to the Lord's Supper, let's read it together. Realize, realize. What? Realize. Let's pray together as our elders. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, just like Jesus when he was tempted, that when we are tempted, that we would not be easy prey for the prince of the powers of the air of this world. That we'd be able to see the truth from the false, to see the real from the evil, to be able to choose to do good rather than just be uh, confused and not know what to do. Lord, we want to be people of truth. The truth will set us free. And so, Lord, in these last few minutes, these seconds, before the distribution of the elements, Lord, if any of us have been confused, then wondering, then not living up to the standard, because we don't even know what the standard is. We, we don't even know how to self-evaluate. And yet, your word says to evaluate ourselves and then partake. Lord, help us before the sacraments receive, help us to receive then let us pray. And I would pray this not only in the name of Jesus, but Lord, for the safety of ourselves, because you said if we do this in an unworthy, unholy, unrighteous manner, we are asking for condemnation to be poured out upon us. Lord, help us to not just take 